We're right across the river tonight in Williamsport, Pennsylvania at the Cell Bluff Nightclub, formerly the old Lycoming County Prison. Somebody standing here with us. As I turn into the cell, the lights turned off, my flashlight turned off. I walked back upstairs within two minutes from doing the sound check, and all my faders are pushed in. There's no one else in the room. Jesus Christ, did you hear it? Did anybody hear it? You're searching for something. Whether you realize it or not, you are. Dude, get in the car! It's in your genes. It's part of your nature. It's who you are. You need to know. For us, the search began a single house. A single house in a small quiet town that turned out to be incredibly haunted. We became driven to find out more. So now we travel the back roads and rural mountains all across the state, seeking out other groups like us, their haunted locations, and documenting the untold stories of small town Pennsylvania. So we keep searching, searching for answers. We need to know. So we're heading right across the river tonight to Williamsport, Pennsylvania, to the Cell Block Nightclub, a local hotspot that happens to be housed in the old Lycoming County Jail building. This place has been at the top of our list for a while now. In my younger days, I used to work as a bouncer here, and Kimber was a bartender here for years, so we both know some of the stories of this place firsthand. From unexplained footsteps to mysterious whistling and even chairs being thrown, this place has had some incredible activity reported here. So after doing some research to get some of my facts straight, I began to realize if you were unfortunate enough to be a prisoner here a hundred plus years ago, this was a very dark and miserable place. They actually hung ten people here in what is now the band room, and there were a lot of other recorded deaths on the property as well. So needless to say, it should be a very interesting location. So the old Lycoming County Prison where the Cell Block Nightclub now resides can be dated back to 1799. It operated for over 60 years before a fire damaged the building. As time passed, the conditions in the prison became deplorable, with overcrowding and medical concerns among the chief issues. In 1977, a class action lawsuit was filed by some of the inmates protesting the conditions there. Plans were made for the building of a new facility, and in 1986, the new prison opened a few blocks away. The building was purchased and remodeled in the 1980s and 90s. In 2001, it was sold again and turned into the Cell Block Nightclub, a local hotspot that offers several bars and a variety of entertainment. Now, numerous stories of paranormal activity have been reported here over the years. I remember hearing stories when I worked there as a bouncer 10 years ago. Glasses being thrown, chairs being knocked off the bar while we were cleaning, 
and even a shot glass moving on its own. Phantom footsteps have also been reported by numerous staff on many occasions while closing up for the night. I tracked down and met with a local amateur historian who had a wealth of knowledge on the prison, and she graciously provided me with her research on the condition that she would not be identified. So a special thank you goes out to her. This information was very valuable. So as far as deaths here, we uncovered many. But again, there were also numerous stories of obvious pain and anguish that could easily account for the activity that has been reported here over the years. Ten public executions were performed at the prison. These hangings were carried out in the corner of the recreational area where the stage now sits. The death row inmates were kept in the basement of the prison in the last six cells near the stairs coming up onto the grounds. The public was invited to these proceedings, and the old bell of the prison, high in the tower, was rung when the deed was completed. Another interesting story is that of Lloyd Britton. In 1870, he was accused and convicted of stabbing another man to death in the city. But from the very first day, he professed his innocence, and until his very last breath, he continued to do so. Several years later, a Mr. Thompson confessed to the crime. So it seems now that an innocent man's life was taken here for a crime he did not commit. Several other death row inmates decided to take matters into their own hands and committed suicide before they ever saw the gallows. Two of them cut their own throats with razors. Another cut his own tongue with a razor and slowly bled to death in his cell, while yet another decided to perform the hanging himself in private. So in 1880, another interesting event happened. Catherine Miller and George Smith schemed and carried out the killing of Catherine's husband they were convicted and sentenced to hang. While both were standing on the gallows, their nooses fitted tightly around their necks. George confessed to the murder, but said that woman had laid the plans. When Catherine's turn came to speak to the crowd, she could not, and only sobbed uncontrollably. But moments before they were dropped, she instead let out a scream. It was described later as a piercing screech that where even the stoutest of hearts were melted. The most infamous and evil death row inmate who stayed in this prison was clearly William Hummel. In what used to be called Black Hole near present-day Montgomery, a rag peddler who had been married to his new bride only a week inexplicably decided to kill her and her three young children with an axe while they slept. He was convicted and sentenced to death. As you can imagine, the proceedings drew much interest from the public and once executed, he was displayed in a local store where the owner charged admission for a chance to see the corpse. With no money to his name and no one to claim his body, he was supposedly buried in the back corner of the recreational yard at the prison. We could find no confirmation of this story, though. More recently, in 1975, a fire killed three juveniles at the prison. They had reportedly set fire to their mattresses in an apparent escape attempt. The smoke filled their cell before the guards noticed the fire and the three teenage boys had lost their lives. This tragic event happened in the room that the owner uses as an office now. Now I have to say, we ran into one more thing when we met with the historian and we went over the research she had gathered. I started noticing some very strange coincidences when it came to the dates for some of these events. First, I met with a historian on November 16th. This just so happened to be the date of the Hummel killings. It was also the date of the innocent man, Lloyd Britton, being hanged. We had scheduled our next investigation of the cell block the very next day on November 17th. It seems November 18th was the 40th anniversary of the three young boys dying in the fire. And then our last investigation at the cell block was January 4th. This happened to be the date that George Smith and Catherine Miller, the lady who had let out the ear-piercing scream, were executed. Now we try to be very objective with things like this. Coincidences can happen, but even we found these occurrences very strange. Also, when reading through some of the accounts of the crimes these death row inmates had committed, it personally sickened me, especially the Hummel murders. For a person to commit such terrible acts to another is one thing, but to defenseless children while they sleep was beyond horrific. 
There is no doubt in my mind that some very dark people were once housed in this place and ultimately met their final judgment here. It's also very clear to me that we need to be very careful of how we investigate this location. For evil has definitely been here. We sat down with some of the current staff to get some background on the activity that they've had here. I have to say, they had some pretty good stories. About four years ago, I walked into the building. It was a normal night like any other night, coming in here to do my sound for the cell block. The only people in the room is myself, the band, and one bartender preparing the bar. I go to my sound booth and do my setup for the band, and I do a sound check before everybody gets in the building to make sure the band sounds good before we open the bar. And there's a process to that that uh, involves using a sound board, mixing board. And on the faders, you push forward to make levels for each instrument sound good. And after my setup, I come downstairs to turn the lights off and make sure everything on the stage is clear, get the, the room ready for people to come in. I walked back upstairs within two minutes from doing the sound check and all my faders are pushed down. So Dean, what happened that day? I was on my way to the basement to turn off a hose and once I got down there, I turned my flashlight on because it was still a little bit dark and uh, you know, there's things on the floor and stuff like that I didn't want to trip over. As I turned into the cell, the lights instantly turned off. At the same time, my flashlight turned off. And so I kind of just like backed up into the corner of the cell and felt this weird feeling kind of brush across my neck. Not sure if it was spider web or a hair or what it was, but it creeped me out pretty bad. And then at that instant, instantly, the lights turned back on, my flashlight came back on, and I hightailed it right back up the steps. There was no worrying about the hose. I talked to the owner a bit about the night that we came out and filmed when they were actually open. You know, much like many of the nights we have, there was a uh, few hiccups along the way, but definitely a few more than usual. Um, had a couple of strange uh, incidents. Uh, one thing that was really odd was uh, in the band room, uh, the breaker tripped uh, to basically all the sound equipment, which has never really happened during a night that I can recall. Uh, we did see that uh, one of the, the breakers was tripped. That means something caused it to trip, not like, you know, someone had hit it or anything like that. It tripped, uh, which doesn't happen. Uh, and then we also uh, had a couple of other issues that night. We had uh, a mechanical bull out in the courtyard, which tripped, uh, I believe, three times throughout the night. We had to keep resetting it, but we did have it a month ago. Nothing had happened. And uh, yeah, they were just kind of uh, strange situations, I guess. It was a rather interesting coincidence that it happened on the night that you guys were here filming, everything like that. Um, but yeah, it was definitely interesting. So with this place being so large, we decided to bring in some extra help. Here we go. Ron and Linda Stevens from RIP Researchers and Paranormal are experienced investigators and gladly made the two and a half hour trip north tonight from their home just outside of Philadelphia. We also called our good friends Mark and Paula Anstein to give us a hand as well. They are well known and respected sensitives from the Gettysburg area and have helped us out on several investigations in the past. We figured with all the deaths at this place over the years that maybe they can offer some additional insights into what's going on here. We started the investigation in the band room, and right after Ron had finished setting up their equipment, things started to go off all around us. William Dunlap, are you here? Is there anybody here who knew him? If somebody is here lighting that up, could you light one or the other? We have a ton, ton of uh, different gadgets that have lights on them. If you just go near them, they should light up. 
which will let us know you're here. We're not here to harm you. Do you like us being here? Or would you like us to leave? Do you like us here? I just felt something on my leg. I just felt something big time on my leg. <laughs> it, it felt like something jumped on my leg. Maybe it was a bug. Ke Kevin, I'm going to turn the Was that you that touched Linda's leg? Is anybody down here that was not supposed to be, that they convicted and you did not do the crime? Is that why you're still here? You want to get out of here, don't you? Who was the black guy that was on? Who was that, Kevin Dunlop? Yeah, it was uh, Lloyd something, Lloyd Britton. Britton. Britton? Yeah. His last name was Britton, yeah, and they found out he was really Ron eventually broke out their portal Hi. device. It's basically an enhanced spirit box, and they've had a lot of success with it in the past. What did you say? The word is cell block. Cell block. We need you to say that before I turn off the radio. And we only leave the radio on for 10 minutes, so try not to sink real long. Please say cell block. That lets us know you're here and you're trying to communicate. Can you try and say cell block, please? There's something over here. What's going on? <laughs> We're surrounded. I can tell you this, I've never had that many REM pods go off continuously off and then the well, thing is just not stopped. It's all over the place too, yeah. you know what I mean? Right when he was going to turn it off, he got this response. Okay, 10 seconds, i got to turn it off. Wow. Go away. Okay, 10 seconds, i got to turn it off. Now we caught over 40 EVPs at the cell block during our investigation there. A lot of them were low quality, but here's a couple of the better ones from the band room. I just know there's feels like that. Do it feel like there's just a, like a hangout spot or something here? It just, just feels like there's more than one person. Yeah. Hangout spot or something here. It just, just feels like there's more than one yeah. person. In this one, I'm talking about William Hummel supposedly being buried in the corner. Kind of a uh, old tale, you know what I mean? All the buried in the corner. Buried in the corner. All the buried in the corner. Buried in the corner. When we first started setting up in the pub, I got this woman's voice on the video camera. Anybody 
somebody make some kind of noise in here? I know it's loud, but could somebody knock? We spent a decent amount of time up in the pub, but only got the one EVP from the video camera. Unfortunately, she never said another word. Yep. Now the office again is where the three teenage boys were killed in the fire. You could tell Mark definitely felt something in these rooms. It's nice and quiet in here. Yeah. We got a couple EVPs here. One of them was pretty clear, although we can't quite figure out what it said. See what you think. Anybody here want to confess anything? convicted should you be freed if so you can come in here and join us you can come out of your cell tonight you won't get in trouble the sheriff isn't here right now. Now, because of time, we can't show you everything that we got. But we did capture EVPs in nearly every spot we investigated at. But again, most were low quality. The VIP area was probably the quietest of all the places we visited in terms of background noise. Here's one of the better EVPs we caught there. If you killed your family, If you killed your family. So, Kathy, tell me what you guys just heard. Well, I'm not sure what it was. Kim and I went over near the restrooms, and I thought Linda was behind Kim and didn't think much of it. And then we went out in the hallway, and like Linda wasn't there. <laughs> but we both heard it. It sounded, it sounded like someone was dragging their feet or something. I thought I heard like this moaning, like dragging. Something like a moaning or dragging. Yeah, exactly. Really eerie, kind of mm -hmm. deep. Mm -hmm. well, we were getting a lot of readings down here, so we wanted to come back down. Kathy and I, in particular, had some good communication down here. So let's see if we can talk to you again, hear your story, communicate with us. And my meter's lighting up pretty good. So is Jody's. Thank you. Damn. Is there somebody standing here with us? So, I can't imagine what it would feel like to be on death row the day before you're going to die and be down in one of these cells. Can you tell us what that's like? Well, there's something right out here, Kevin. It just went right down through here from, um, I don't know, 10 feet in front of us, about midway up. It's shot down to the left of the 45. I don't know if you got that on the camera or not. Mm -hmm. We finished up in the basement, and I have to say it was probably the most active spot in the place. 
Mark commented several times he felt spirits were there with us. You could just feel things moving around you in the darkness. It was pretty scary. My name is Mark and my friend here is Kevin. My name is Mark and my friend here is Kevin. Why is the water? I don't know, it's getting more intense. It's okay. Not Now, because of Paula's limited mobility, she kind of positioned herself in the main bar area with their service dog, Thelma. I saw somebody in the room where you all were back in the other section. Somebody went past the big way there. Really? Yeah, from the left to the right. She definitely sees something in that room. A couple times it seemed like Thelma was even noticing things in the other rooms. Now this last clip, I had walked out into the band room by myself because I forgot a piece of equipment and I heard this with my own ears. Jesus Christ, did you hear it? Did anybody hear it? Jesus Christ, did you hear it? Did anybody hear it? It definitely gave me a scare. In the middle of a bustling city, on a busy main street, sits an old stone building with a very sordid past. Many people have been incarcerated in this prison since it opened more than 160 years ago. From the everyday petty thief to rapists and murderers, they were all kept here over the years in these dark and lonely cells. In the last 15 years though, it's become a much different venue. Gone are the prison guards and cell bars, being replaced by strobe lights, crowds of people, loud music and laughter. But some say, when the lights are dimmed at the end of the night, and the music fades away, it becomes a stage for many curious events. From unexplained footsteps, to equipment malfunctions, to shot glasses moving on their own and chairs violently being thrown, this place has had many strange stories to tell. Now people will always come here to drink, relax, and have fun, and they may even laugh at the stories that are told of this place, many of them unaware of the building's unsettling history. For us though, in the quiet and dark of the night, the walls of this place still seem to echo with the voices of the people who died here so very long ago.